Come on, let's give God another hand clap of praise. Welcome again to World Changers Church. Father God, we just submit ourselves to you during this time. Holy Spirit, you have free reign in this place. We thank you for the revelation that will take place and for the wisdom that will come out that we can practically apply in our everyday lives. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory out and praise for that in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 Well, we are on part 11, glory to God, <laughs> of uh, We Are the Righteous. And I'm excited about, um, I'm always excited about the word, but I'm excited about today's uh, message because uh, we talked about some things at our Thursday night South Church location. I tell you what, man, if you're not getting down there, if you're not tuning into that, you're missing out. Uh, we have a good time in the Word, and uh, we had a great time this week, uh, and we're going to talk about some of that, but uh, we're still talking about we are the righteous, uh, but I want to pick up where I left off last week and then combine it with what we talked about on Thursday, and last week, I left off showing you some things on the board about the sequence of life of the believer, and, and this is very important because... As believers, we often have relegated our lives to just trying to get saved and maintain that salvation. I mean, that's been the goal. Don't go to hell. Amen? And it's, I got to get saved, and then I got to stay saved. Amen? And I stay saved by doing right. I stay saved by not messing up. That's what many of us have been taught and so we spend our entire lives trying to do that, but something kind of blows that out the water when you start learning and understanding about grace. Once you learn and understand that it's not my behavior that gets me saved, it's my belief. And while good behavior has its place, good behavior is not required for me to get saved. If that's the case, nobody will be saved. Amen. Um, and when you learn that and start growing in that, and then you say, well, wait a minute. Well, if salvation is not the end of the plan for my life, then what is the end of the plan? What is my life supposed to look like after I get saved? Well, that's very important, and that's what we're going to look at uh, real quick. Uh, Melissa, can I get your help? Because you write so much better than me. And uh, <laughs> I wrote this last time. I saw y'all looking like that. What the world? Where are you writing? <laughs> Uh, Y'all give it up for Pastor Melissa. <laughs> Her sexy fine self. All right, come on. Um, all right, so, uh, so I'm, we're going to write these up here, and then we're going to kind of break some of them down, okay? So the first thing is love. Love is where this all begins. Now, whose love do you think that is? Yeah, God's love. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so Love the world that he did what? Gave. He gave who? I'll use the black one. Uh, he gave who? Right, that whosoever. Who is whosoever? That's everybody. That's everybody. Is that the, oh, if that one doesn't work, use the green one or the blue one. Uh, is that the black person? Is that the white person? The male? The female? The older? The younger? The Muslim? The Buddhist? Yeah, this was for everybody. That whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So this begins with the love of God. Now, next, after the love of God, you have grace. Everybody say grace. Grace, grace is God's favor that showed up in a person. His name is Jesus. Amen? Now, again, I'm going to go back and I'm going to give you scripture for all these. Jesus, the next one is, made a sacrifice of his life. You didn't make the sacrifice, Jesus did, amen? And he was a worthy sacrifice, was he not? What made him worthy? He had no sin. He had no sin and he was a worthy sacrifice and as a result, you and I benefited from his worthiness. I'm gonna say that again. You and I benefited from his worthiness. Now I know you've been taught that you need to be worthy, but he was worthy for you. And because he was worthy for you, you get to ride on the back of his worthiness. 
So if I'm riding on the back of Jesus' worthiness, then what am I trying to do trying to be worthy? Now that doesn't mean I shouldn't act right, but I act right because he acted right. I act right in honor and thanksgiving to what he did. I don't try to act right to earn what he's already earned. After sacrifice, you have forgiveness. Because of his sacrifice, I am now forgiven. Because of his sacrifice, you are forgiven. Now tell me, what are you forgiven of? Sins. T talk to me. What sins? Somebody said all of them. Exactly. Don't want to tell your business. That's all right. All of them. All of them. Just the ones from last week? Past, present, and future. Why past, present, and future? First of all, you weren't even alive when he went on the cross. Amen. But it's all of them. But, but again, this goes against a lot of people's understanding because a lot of people think, oh, it's just, it's just the ones of today, so I got to keep going back and, and, and getting this right and getting this right. You need to keep going back and having a repentant heart. You need to keep going back and changing that mindset. You need to keep going back and saying, I need to stop doing that. Let me head his way that he wants me to head. But Jesus is not getting up on the cross every time you sin. His blood has secured freedom from sin. Again, I'm going to give you the word with these things, but I'm just hitting them up because so, there's a lot of them. Uh, now, after I am saved, this is all his work so far in the work of Jesus. After I am saved, now I choose his will for my life. Did you know you can't even choose the will of God for your life until you're saved? I'm going to show you a scripture that clearly says you know his will after you let him transform you. See, now think about that. Somebody's a homosexual, they're not saved, and you go up to that individual. I've seen, you know, there's been a lot of um, gay pride things happening right now. And you see a lot of uh, people in the news, or not the news, uh, on uh, Twitter and in places like that, uh, preaching at people at the gay pride, you know, things and telling them your lifestyle is wrong, so get saved. That is the essence of what I'm talking about today. That's backwards. They can't change until they are saved. It's the Savior that delivers them from the bad behavior. But because of your insecurity and your ignorance, you're going up to them trying to get them to change their behavior by their own willpower. He's the power, the blood's the power that changes you. So until I have Holy Spirit on the inside, wait, are you saying the Holy Spirit will move on the inside of a homosexual? That's exactly what I'm saying. He moves on the inside of the liar. He moves on the inside of the cheater. He moves on the inside of the adulterer. He moves on the inside of the fornicator. Why can't he move on the inside of the homosexual? Oh, y'all don't want to hear truth today, but I'm going to give it to you anyway because I, I only got so much time and I just drank coffee. So, uh, <laughs> But so to try to go and get somebody to change without the one who changes, that's crazy. But that's what we want. We want you to look right so that he can move into a worthy vessel. Your vessel ain't worthy yet. You ain't perfect. He's the one who perfects you. He moves willingly inside of dirty vessels. And then the word says he cleanses you. He changes you. Their behavior only puts a target on their back for you to say that's one who needs him. Not my opinion, not my judgment, they need Jesus. They need their grace-based, loving Savior. They need unconditional love. You know what that means? That means under no condition does he stop loving you, including your bad behavior. And the gospel is going to them and sharing that God right now is more concerned about you than what you're doing. Because trust me, they need him and they know it. He just don't look like who you present. And so you think they're rejecting you, they're rejecting the image that you're portraying because Jesus is supposed to be on the inside of you who is the express perfect image of God who is love. But what you're showing them is not love, so they don't see Jesus, and therefore they don't see God, so they back up off you. 
and not realizing that what you're doing is by attacking their behavior, you're attacking them. No, I, I'm just, uh, me and my brother-in-law were talking, and it's, it's people say, I'm just, lo I'm loving the sinner and, and hating the sin. No, 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 you have to understand the sinner is the sin until they're saved. And once they're saved, they're called the righteous. But you gotta understand your approach needs to change. You are attacking the sinner and the sin all at once. God didn't ask you to do that. He said that's his job. We are to present him to them and then he attacks the sin from the inside out while saving the sinner. I said he attacks the sin from the inside out and he saves the sinner. You're just supposed to present him to them. He didn't ask you to judge their sin. He already judged their sin and he put it on the back of Jesus and they are now found not guilty. And you're supposed to go tell them because of what Jesus did, you're no longer guilty. In the midst of their sin. Didn't it say while we were yet sinners? He saved us. Now, this is the gospel. Amen? What, I forgot which one I was on. That's, oh, we just on grace? We got to move. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, sacrifice. Did we talk about sacrifice? Yeah, sacrifice was the third one. Then forgiveness. I received forgiveness. And then one, two, three, four, five. The fifth one is now my belief or my faith. Sacrifice. Uh, forgiveness. and now belief slash faith. So God loves us, grace came to save us, Jesus gave up his life and is sacrificed, now I'm forgiven, right? Now this is for everybody, this, these five, these four are true for everyone in the world. Now here's where you gotta be careful, because some will say because of those first four, everybody's saved. Because Jesus died for everyone, correct? That means everyone is already forgiven. Now here's the part that really blew my mind when I really thought about it. Everyone in the world has been forgiven, correct? Because he didn't die and then only some got forgave and some didn't. Everyone's forgiven, but it only takes effect into your life if you believe. We've been reading over and over again in the Bible about belief is the only requisite for us to receive what Jesus did. Belief connects me to all of this. It's there whether I want it or not. That's why it should be impossible. It ought to break your heart to see people out there living and dying in sin knowing that all of this is available right now for you. And the only thing you need to do is believe it. I don't care what your age is. I don't care what you did yesterday. You have the ability to receive, not make, to receive your forgiveness. You don't have to do nothing but believe it. Have faith in what Jesus did. That's all you got to do. And when you witness, by the way, that's all you got to say. I know we have seven steps. I used to be in, on the SWAT team, the soul winning in action you know, training team, yeah. Where we could get people saved in four minutes or less. And I know we had our, you know, I know we got our, and I'm not, I'm not demeaning that per se, but all it boils down to is, listen, love sent grace who sacrificed and you're forgiven whether you want it or not. Do you want it? Do you want forgiveness? Do you want to connect to God's love? Well, then accept what Jesus did. Oh, that's all I got to do? Uh-huh. But what about, what about my weed I'm smoking right now? Oh, he'll take care of that. Don't worry about that. Again, another conversation I had, he might not even tell them about their weed thing just yet because he might want to work on the pain that they're trying to cover with the weed. So he may start ministering to them about first healing them from the inside out of the issues and then the weed will take care of itself. But you're looking at the weed or you're looking at the sex or you're looking at this, that, and other. He's like, I don't even see that. I see them. 
because the sacrifice forgave their sins. So now back up and let the doctor get to work because I'm getting to the root of the problem. So once we realize that these four apply to everybody, but this is what makes you a Christian. It's believing. It's in the believing that the benefits now of salvation go into effect for your life. It's at this point after believing that one is then made righteous. All of this makes you have the ability to be righteous, but it's not until number five happens that you step into that. There's a scripture that says we all have this place of undeserved privilege that has been created for us. And another scripture says how Jesus takes our hand and brings us into this place. Everybody's spot of righteousness has been created, but many spots are sitting empty because people don't believe in what Jesus did. And our responsibility, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but our responsibility is to show them what he did so that they'll believe and then step into their place. Amen. And all these spots is what God wants filled. If you understand that, say amen. amen. So once I'm in my spot, once I've been accepted, once I've accepted the fact that what he did made me righteous and I'm now saved, now Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me and I have the ability to go to God and now say, what? do you want with my life? I get to choose his will is the number six one. I get to choose his will for my life. Now it's your choice. Many people are saved and still not choosing his will. Amen? Amen. Now, some of us aren't choosing his will because you're still stuck at one through four. Does God love me? Is grace real? What did Jesus really sacrifice for me? Am I forgiven? And because you're stuck in this loop, you haven't moved to what is your will for my life because you think you're not worthy. Your worthiness is not based on your actions. Where is your actions in all of this? Where is your, where is your, the only, exactly, the only thing is believing. Where is your, I got to live perfect in all of this. That's why Jesus was perfect. But many of you think I have to live perfect somewhere in here in order for this to stay intact. That's, that's he did it all. So now I can't even know God's will for my life until I've accepted him into my heart. And now, of course, he gets to tell me what my purpose is. Many people are trying to figure out, what am, what am I here for, Lord? What am I, what, what you say? He's on the inside. But now you're going to have to make a choice. He's going to show you your purpose, but you're going to have to be willing to choose his will. I had to choose his will. First thing I wanted to be was an electric engineer. The second thing I wanted to be was a fighter pilot in the Marines. But he told me I was supposed to be a preacher when I was little, and I wanted to get away from that. Who wants to grow up since you were three knowing you're supposed to be a preacher? Can't go to the parties like everybody else. You can't do everything. I tried. But no, I would literally hear the Holy Spirit talking to me. And I was like, man, this sucks. <laughs> I can't do nothing. I mean, imagine growing up and you hear the Holy Spirit. So everybody want to come get prayed for by you in high school. Everybody asking you what should they do. I don't know, get saved. You ask them, you know. But I, but I knew, so it kept, it kept curving my decisions because I had made him Lord of my life. And it affected every decision that I had and does to this day. But once I did that, I was able to more easily follow his purpose for my life. I'm not saying I was perfect along the way. I'm a human being. I made many mistakes. But thank God for grace. So even though I made mistakes, even though you may make mistakes, grace is there and you can always find yourself saying, Lord, I'm getting back on your path. I'm turning away from what I was doing, which is repentance. Now, again, tell me what's your will. 
It's like Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This is the sequence of life for the believer. So, so now you've moved out of, am I saved? Now you've moved out of, am I right with God? Now it's time to live for God. When you guys hear me make statements like, don't get stuck at the foot of the cross. Many people, oh, Jesus saved me, oh, Jesus helped me. He don't did that. You know, uh, um, this is one song we used to sing in the choir. I used to love it. He will sh uh, show up. Y'all remember that song, show up? He's shown up. It, it's, it's done. It's finished. And, and what we've done is we have got stuck right here for many of us at the cross. And the cross did its job. And without the cross, we'd all be lost. Amen? But now it's time to move forward. Jesus ain't on the cross no more. He had other stuff to do. I said he had other appointments after the cross. And so do you. So it's time to get up and say, what is your will after the cross for my life? Amen? Let's keep going. Uh, so after that one, um, now that I've chosen his will, uh, God now transformed my mind. God transforms my mind. Don't think that just because you chose his will, now you're just going to be able to automatically do it. He's taken the responsibility to transform you, to do his will. It's a scripture that says he will give you the desire. I didn't want to do this. Sometimes I still don't. But I say, Lord, give me the desire today to do your will. And he'll do that every single time. This is not about us. It's always been about him. Amen? Amen. As he transforms my mind, the next one is, now good works can be produced in my life. Now we've finally gotten to you doing something. After he saved us, after he's made us righteous, after he's transformed us, now we do. It's like he's rebuilding you from the inside out. And once he's done, then he sends you out and says, now you're ready to do what I've called you to do. And here we've had that whole thing backwards. We've had get right so that you can receive God's love. Get right so that grace can take effect in your life. Get right so you can be a worthy sacrifice for the sacrifice. Get right so you can be forgiven. Get right so you can prove your faith. Get right so you can be right. I'm right because he was right, period. Amen. And I can't even, can I say this, y'all? It's not a cop-out. I can't even act right without him. I can't act right without Jesus. I act a plum fool without Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit on the inside of me, I lose it. I'll be caught up in my emotions. I'll be caught up in my feelings. I'll be looking at everything and everyone and every which way and saying what I want to say and doing what I want to do. I'll be out of control if it wasn't for the saving power of Jesus in my life. And the moment you come to that same conclusion, you can be saved too. If he's your savior, what did he save you from? See, we use these words and we don't really pay attention to what they actually mean. He saved you from sin and the penalty of sin. And, but then we say that and then we go and try to act right on our own. No, 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 no. Holy Spirit, what do I do? Holy Spirit, how can I do this? Especially when that real stuff hits you hard, you know what I mean? And it causes your emotions to start going out of whack and you want to act wrong. You just want to smack somebody. You just want to go off on somebody. And then I, I guess what? I need help. What does the Bible say? I can boldly go where? To the throne of where? The throne of what? Yeah, whose throne is that? Yeah. And I can do what? Not just sit there, not just fix it on my own, ask for 
help. When? He told you it's going to be some trouble. But you got to help. I said, you got help. You got the Holy Ghost. You got Jesus who has already helped you. And you can ask for help in a time of trouble. You think you have a sin problem? You don't have a sin problem. What you have is a transformation problem. And you have to allow him to transform you and then your behavior will change. If you understand that, say amen. Okay, so as good works are, can be produced, another way of saying that is the Holy Spirit's fruit is produced in you by him and then it comes out of you as you allow it. Because if you don't allow it, if you don't, what's, what's the fruit of the Spirit? Love. And if you don't allow, you have to choose to let love come out your mouth. You have to choose to let love come out your hands and feet. He told you to go to that outreach on Saturday. You're like, uh uh, I don't feel like I'm tired. Well, you just chose not to let love come out of you. Oh, your new root, because you're the righteous, is a root of love. It's no longer the root of sin. You now have love in you, but you got to let love come out. So some of us have all this love in us that we've tried to put into a place so that we can keep running our lives. It's time to let love loose on the inside of you so that it can just be pouring out of you. You ought to be just overflowing with love. When you're overflowing with love and not fear and not panic and not unbelief, when you're overflowing with love, then that's when people can't help but be around you because they just keep experiencing God every time they experience you. That's what he wanted. He wanted us to be his, that's why all creation is waiting for the manifestation of his sons and daughters. All creation is waiting for his sons and daughters who are loved to step up and just have love oozing out of them. Because they already got fear, they already got doubt, they already got unbelief, they already got sin, and they're looking for some light. You're the light, the light's on the inside of you, and that's the love coming out. That's what your behavior, your good works, is really supposed to be all about. But what Satan has done is he's deceived the church in thinking that your good works are to save you. He wants you to think your good works is to make you worthy of the cross. The cross is settled. That's what you just ate and drank about. This equals this, and it's settled. Now what about this? This is you and the Holy Ghost. I said, this is you and the Holy Ghost. You're not alone. Jesus did his part. Now he's saying, I'm waiting on you to do yours. You still trying to be saved. You still trying to be righteous. You, that's done. It's settled. I need you for them is what he's saying. If you're understanding that, say amen. amen. So, as this love is produced in and out of me, my fruit, another way of saying that, blesses other people. Your fruit is for other people. Your fruit is for other people. Your fruit is for other people. Well, what about me? You're good. But I don't feel good. You're good. Either you believe it or you don't. But my bill, you know, collector said I'm not good. You're good. Either you believe it or you don't. All right, I hear you spiritually, but how do I do that practically? What's your will, Lord, concerning this bill? What's your will concerning my mate? What's your will concerning my children? What's your will concerning my job? What's your will concerning everything in my life? Help me see it the way you see it. Help me transform my thinking so that I can say your will, speak your will, live, live your will, and stop worrying about me and instead get to focusing on your agenda. God will tell you what job to be at. He'll tell you who to marry. He'll tell you uh, 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 how to live. He'll tell you what to cut off in your life. He'll tell you everything you need to do, and you'll find yourself on this abundant path of you being all good. Your life will look like Jesus's. Worry-free, provided for, 
healthy, powerful. That's what it will look like. Why? Because God will keep you on that path because he needs you good to go so that your fruit cannot be eaten by you, but it can be ate by others. Jesus didn't spend time worrying about it. How much time did Jesus spend saving himself? How much time did Jesus spent trying to be righteous? He was the son of God. All creation are waiting for us so that they can become children of God. They all have this applied to them, but they don't believe. This is what makes them children. He created them all, and he said, I'm sending you, Jesus, for all creation. But they need to see the sons and daughters so they can experience God. And as soon as we get the focus off of us and onto him, then they can be like us and therefore be like him. If you understand that, say amen. amen. All right, so let me give you a couple of scriptures on this. Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. See, I don't ever, you, somebody might say, what? why are we teaching this? This all, I mean, all, all this year almost has been foundation. It's like redoing our foundation. It's like we, we, we're tearing down our old house of understanding and we're, we're putting a new foundation in so that we can build this new house. Your new house is going to start from now his will. But we have to get the foundation settled this year. Yeah. Do I know God and do I know what he's done for me? Amen. So now that you're you know, starting to get to know him and what he did for you, now you can get to live in. Some of us are stuck because we ain't been able to live. And this, this sequence of the life of the believer is gonna, is, is, is gonna help you see where you, where you might have been missing it when it came to your activity. My activity is all for what he wants me to do, amen? Are you in Romans? All right, it said, but uh, God commendeth what? His love towards who? So, so God's love is for all of us. In that, while we were yet in what state? Christ died for us. That's literally all it is right here. While I was a sinner, while they're sinners, not when they act right. Does a sinner act right? Are you mad at them for being who they are? The question is, are you ready to be who you are? We don't need no more in the closet Christians. Come out and be who you are. Amen. And stop being mad at them for being who they are. At least they, at least they real. Amen. But God commended his love towards us. His love was the solution to this problem. His love is what sent Christ to die for us. You see that? Okay, go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Let's look at grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You, you, you don't have to write those down, but... It says, for by what? For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. That right there, when I read that and really read it about seven, eight, nine, whenever pastor started preaching on grace years ago, it blew my mind. I said, all this time I've been, it's been of myself. I'm saved because I did this and did that. And in the Bible says very clearly, you were saved by grace, by God's goodness, by his favor, by the simple fact that he knew you don't deserve it, but he loved you so much he gave it to you anyway. It makes you emotional just thinking about it. Because all of us have lived a life on earth where we had to earn everything. It's like old girl in the color purple, ain't nobody ever gave you nothing. You had to fight all your life. And, and, and so we used to fighting, we used to working, and we used to toiling, and now it's, you're just giving me this? You're just giving me this freedom? You're just giving me this deliverance? You're just giving me this prosperity? You're just giving me this promotion of my life? You're just giving me, you're, you're giving me your son? Did you know you cost a whole son of God? That's how precious you are? And he did it just because he loves you. It is the gift of God. Verse 9. Not of works. 
What does works mean? Efforts. Self-righteous efforts. What, what else? Even think about that word real quick. Self-righteousness. I make myself right with God. Wrong. It's not by your personal activity to be right that you're saved. Lest any man should boast. Does that scripture make even more sense? Yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's part of what grace is about. Um, let me show you something else about grace. Go to John 1, 14. Because grace is not just a topic. It's not just a thing that happened. Grace is a person. John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh. Word, capital W. Uh, actually, go to John 1, 1 first, and then we'll come here because I need to show you the sequence. John 1, 1, and then we'll go to uh, 14. Yeah, in the beginning was what? The Word. the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, verse two. The same was in the beginning with God, verse three. All things were made by him, and without him was, was not anything made that was made, verse four. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, verse 14. And the word, the same word, was made flesh. Who was in heaven and all of that and then was made flesh? Jesus. So now we know we're talking about Jesus. And dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory and the glory of, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Keep going into this. Full of grace and truth. And I told you guys, when I went and studied that full of grace and truth, it literally, that word, uh, full of grace and truth, uh, full of grace, it means he was permeated with, it was one with him. He was grace, which is the truth. He doesn't have some grace and have some truth. That's who he is. When you say I'm saved by grace, you're saying I'm saved by Jesus. When you say Jesus saved me, you're saying grace saved me. Now, if Jesus equals grace, I wish I had another board. If Jesus equals grace and Jesus is the word, then the word is, okay, okay, for some of us who, <laughs> if Jesus equals grace and Jesus is the word, then the word is, some of y'all like, I did not like algebra. I didn't either. I, I barely passed it. Uh, I, I don't even think, I don't, did I pass? I don't know. But the word is grace. And the word is truth. So that's why I made that statement the other day about what is the word? Now, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture inspires us towards the truth of him. But the word, when you're telling somebody I'm preaching the word, what you're saying is I'm preaching grace. I'm giving them the truth and the truth shall set you free. Well, we just define the truth. The truth is Jesus. The truth is grace. The truth is, truth is the word. So you can't go to somebody preaching law, 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 or works, 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 or whatever like that, and then in turn say, I'm preaching the word because you're talking some scriptures. I'm preaching the word means I'm preaching Jesus. It means I'm preaching grace. I'm preaching the truth. Now, let me take some of the Christianese out of that. When I say I'm preaching Jesus, what I'm saying is I'm preaching what he did right here. When somebody says, do you believe on Jesus? What they're saying is, do you believe what grace did? Do you believe he sacrificed and you're forgiven and now you're the righteous? That's what it means to say, I believe on Jesus. What you're saying is not, I believe there was a guy named Jesus and I like the stuff he did. What you're saying is, I believe Jesus was my sacrifice. And I believe because of what he did, I'm forgiven. And because I'm now forgiven, I am right with God. Not because of my works, it's because of his work. Not because of my blood, it's because of his blood. That's what it means to say, I believe the word. I believe the truth. I believe on Jesus. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Praise God. So he was full of grace and truth, which means he was permeated. 
And this was all done by his blood. Now, I want to pause real quick here. Do you really, truthfully understand the power of the blood? We talked about this on Thursday night, that the blood is not just, you know, again, just this thing. The, the way the Holy Spirit showed me is the blood is indeed the true currency of the kingdom. Now, here's what that word currency means. Cur- currency is generally a, an accepted form of payment. Money is currency. Now, between different countries and, and different, uh, in between different countries, you have different currencies. And different currencies have different value. But in the kingdom, the currency was the blood. It was the blood that purchased you. It was the blood that purchased you. You don't believe me? Let me, let me show it to you. Because some of y'all are like, for real? Yep. Colossians chapter 1. Let's go there. Colossians chapter 1. Let's look at verse, we'll start at verse 13. And uh, let's look at it in the uh, New Living Translation real quick. Because it's important that you understand not that you are the, just that you are the righteousness of God, but that you see how sure you can be about this. Colossians 1.13, it says, For he has, what? Rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Keep going. Who did what? Purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. You were purchased, and as a result, you have freedom. You were purchased, and as a result, you have freedom forgiveness. Do you see that? Do you see that? (laughs) Okay, Uh, verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So when you hear us talking about Christ is the image of God, this is where we get that from. He existed before anything, sounds like what we just read in John. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all. Uh, Over all creation. Keep going. For through him, God created everything, just like you said in John 1, 1, uh, in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rises from the dead. So he is first, somebody say first, in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him, what's that word, reconciled everything to himself. God set this right, not with your help, but he did it by himself. He didn't need us to make this right. The last time he included us in the process, it kind of got messed up. So he reconciled us to himself by himself. Uh, Go to verse 21. Or is that the last one? Okay, 21. We got a 21? Separated, uh, well, no, that's the end of 21. Yes, this includes who? You who were once far away from God. So you were reconciled to him is what this says, isn't it? You were purchased, correct? It says you were his enemies, and then the next part talks about how our thinking were. But I need you to see that this applies to you. He purchased you, and he reconciled you. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Go to Ephesians 1, uh, chapter 7. Ephesians 1, chapter 7. This stuff, this is really important stuff that we really get this and really understand that we are right with God. Again, not by what we did, but by what he did. And his blood is the currency that was used. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he did what? Here it is again. Purchased our freedom with what? The blood of his son. When you went and purchased that uh, shirt or that outfit you got on, what did you use? You used currency. And there was an exchange that happened. The blood of Jesus 
was used to get you back. I've said it before, I'll say it again. He purchased you with his blood and he's pleased with his purchase. God doesn't have buyer's remorse concerning you. He's not trying to put you back. He's not trying to turn you back over. He's not trying to re-gift you to somebody else. God has you and he's good. So he purchased with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. There it is again. That's why all these people that keep trying to dangle sin in your life as a problem, it's not a problem for God. He said, I've already forgiven it. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture that says, I remember your sins no more. You know, anytime you remember your sins is when you come sobbing and all that and reminding them of it. <laughs> oh, oh, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm horrible at this and I'm horrible at that. And he's like, I don't even know what you're talking about because the blood washed that. I don't know what you're talking about because when I purchased you with the blood of Jesus, it emptied your sin account as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing in your sin account. But what about when I sin? It hits the blood. You have a credit of blood. I said, you have a credit of blood. And every time the sin comes in, it gets ate up by the credit that you got. You have a never ending credit of blood. Does that mean I can just do what I want to do? You shouldn't. But as far as it relates to the blood, your sin will never overshadow the blood. Your sin will never gain a greater exchange rate than the blood. The blood will always have more value. Now, what's supposed to happen is, is we're supposed to appreciate that so much, we're supposed to honor that so much, that we then go and say, I want to make you Lord of my life, transform me, so that I get rid of this bad behavior with your help. And I'm going to tell you, now that I'm walking and living in grace, sin is no longer an issue. Somebody said, why, why, why do I still sin? Because you choose to. Because you want to. We're going to talk about a hardened heart. And that's really a heart that has just become like a rock to the voice and the things of God. I'm saved, but I'm not hearing him because I'm hearing me and what I want to do more than him. And for some of us, we're, we're sensitive in some areas, but we're hard in other areas. But the blood has still purchased you and forgave you. You just need to allow him to transform you so that a heart can become soft again in those areas. But you think you're a horrible person because you hadn't figured out how to get out of that thing yet. No, I'm telling you, you're loved, you're precious. Just go to your father and say, help. And he'll start softening that heart. And as you become more sensitive to him, you will know his way, you know his will, and you'll be able to then get away from that thing that, that's been holding you back. Let's keep going. Uh, verse uh, 8. It says, he has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and all understanding. Say that with me. Say, I have all wisdom. I have all, wisdom. I have all understanding. I have all wisdom. Come on, say, I have all wisdom. I have all understanding. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing what to do when I don't know what to do. Anybody don't know what to do in something today? Yeah. Everybody in here has to be raised because you, you don't know what you do. <laughs> we all got something that we're trying to figure out. And God says, I got wisdom on that thing. I'll help you understand what to do in that situation. Verse 9. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan concerning Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. You think you want to be saved. He wants you saved more than, more than you want to be saved. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Verse 11. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ. Do you see that? I want to be like Christ. You're, you're united with him. You have all of him right now. Did you know that? Once you're saved, you're united with Christ. You have him. The question is, is will I choose to acknowledge who I have? You have all truth, all grace, all word, all available to you right now. That's how powerful you are. 
There used to be these uh, series and things taught on the authority of the believer. Your authority is in Christ. And you have all power, all wisdom, understanding, knowledge, grace, truth. You can't lose. You can't lose. You can't be defeated. Jesus said, I've overcome the world, and, and where does he live right, right now? In you. So if he's overcome the world, guess what? You have overcome the world. Can't nothing stop you. We have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance. Amen. Did you know while you were sinning, you were still the chosen? You don't become the chosen once you're saved. You're chosen in advance. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. Verse 12. God's purpose was that uh, we Jews... Uh, and this is Paul writing, so that's why he was saying we Jews, who were uh, the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, those who aren't Jews, have also heard the truth. Now, pause. What's the truth? The word. What's the word? Who's the word? Yeah. Yep. Y'all right. It's all right. Y'all, Jesus, grace. Which one? It's, it's, it's all right. And now you Gentiles have heard about Jesus. And now you Gentiles have heard about grace. And now you Gentiles have heard the truth. And now you Gentiles have heard the word. The good news. Now we have a new equalization. The word, truth, Jesus is the good news. And what's the good news? That God saves you. You don't save you. I don't save you. Mom and daddy don't save you. The priest doesn't save you. Hail Marys don't save you. Buddha can't save you. Harry can't save you. Only God saves you. And that's some doggone good news. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. Now look, it said, and when you. This is part of the good news. This is part of the truth. That you weren't just saved, you've been identified as his own. And then he gave you some equipment to go with your new identity. By giving you the Holy Spirit. Say, I have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. on the inside. Right now. And, and your purchase, your being purchased is, by the way, what gave you all of this. That's why we appreciate the blood. By giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. Verse 14. The Spirit, now we're talking about the Holy Spirit, is God's guarantee that he will give us that inheritance. Remember earlier I said you had an inheritance? The Holy Spirit is the administrator of that inheritance. That he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. Guys, I'm trying to help you understand that you've been purchased and you're secure in the closet of Christ, I guess. You know, but but you're, you, you're, 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 you're secure in that. This was all done by God. This wasn't done by just some man who lies and throws away stuff and changes clothes all the time and, and I want to do, do this, I want to do that. So we, we process this stuff sometimes through human understanding and this is God. Ain't he the same yesterday, today, and forever? So when he made that purchase, he meant it yesterday, today, and he means it forever. You're good with God. He did this so we would praise and glorify God. Him. Say, I've been purchased by the blood. Now, in case you were ever wondering, let me show you something. Go to 1 Peter 18. 1 Peter 18. Let me show you something. Uh, let's read this in Amplified. Are you getting something out of this? Amen. Amen. Y'all got a 1 Peter 1.18 back there? Go on. Hey, can I get a 1 Peter 
All right. Uh, yeah, let's do 18. Yeah. For you now know that who? He paid a what? Uh, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. Here's that word inheritance again. I had an empty life, but now I got a new life that I inherited from God. And the only reason why I have this new inheritance instead of the old inheritance is because he paid a ransom. Now that ransom, that's an interesting word. When do you pay a ransom? When somebody's captured. When somebody's held against their will. When somebody needs to be saved. He paid a ransom and that ransom rescued you. Did you know Jesus is your ransom? Grace was your ransom. The blood is what physically was shed and it is the currency that has so much value and so much power that it goes throughout all eternity and the exchange rate on the blood never changes or loses its value. You equal saved. You equal forgiven and the blood had to pay the price for your sins. And it's valuable enough that it never loses its power or buying power. The blood is better than gold. The blood is better than diamonds. The blood is even better than platinum. The blood is the most powerful currency that's known to man. And that blood has saved you. That blood is what rescued you. That blood is what paid your ransom. And as a result, you don't have this empty life. Stop settling for an empty life. And you settle for the inheritance that you have for God. He has given you an abundant life to the full. So now let it overflow. Accept who you are because the blood has purchased you. You got a God who loves you, who has saved you, who has forgiven you, who has sacrificed for you, and the only thing that he asks you to do is just believe. Just believe that I love you. Just believe that I saved you. Just believe that I've forgiven you. Just believe that I have given you inheritance. Don't do nothing else. I don't want you to do nothing else. Rest and just enjoy the fact of what I've given you. That's the good news that God has done for you. So make a decision today that I rest in the value and in the power of the blood. I rest that I've been rescued. I rest in the fact that God loves me no matter what I see, no matter what I hear. I rest that I have an advocate with the Father. God loves you. And my time is all gone, so I rest my case. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. So, Father God, we just thank and praise you. And we thank you for the good news. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the blood, the, the physical, everybody always looking for something, the physical thing that was shed on earth that was so strong that it took care of stuff in the physical and even in the spiritual and it went throughout all time and all eternity. And so we believe it, we receive it, and we act like it in Jesus' name. Come on, give God another hand clap of praise. Amen.